longer in the wilderness I'll stand. So I cry, I want that mountain, it belongs to me. I want that mountain, sing it out, I want that mountain, where the milk and honey flow, where the grapes of Eshel grow. I want that mountain, I want that mountain, the mountain that my Lord has given me. There was a giant of laziness who said I wouldn't go, and witness for the one who set me free. I'll come from out the wilderness, I'll witness now I know. I want that mountain, it belongs to me. I want that mountain, sing it out, I want that mountain. Where the milk and honey flow, where the grapes of Eshel grow. I want that mountain, I want that mountain. The mountain that my Lord has given me. One faithless giant upon the crest of Hebron's lofty height has vowed that he's the one to make me flee. I'll climb from out the wilderness and trust Jehovah's might. I want that mountain, it belongs to me. I want that mountain, sing it out, I want that mountain. Where the milk and honey flow, where the grapes of Eshel grow. I want that mountain, I want that mountain, the mountain that my Lord has given me. So let every giant of distress and unbelief and sin get ready now to vacate, for you see, I've come from out the wilderness, I know I'm going to win. I want that mountain, it belongs to me. I want that mountain, sing it out, I want that mountain. Where the milk and honey flow, where the grapes of Eshel grow. I want that mountain, I want that mountain. The mountain that my Lord has given me. Amen. All right, you can be seated. I just got a little bit, a little extra touch of my grandpa today. My brother found his airplane that he used to fly. I can't believe it. He found the old plane that he sold, sold it to somebody. It's got Snoopy painted on it and all that stuff. But hey, it's the same plane. I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow. So, you know, that's really something. You think something's long gone and it's still around. So anyway, that was encouraging. All right. Well, um, uh, it's good to see everybody. I want to remind you again about tonight. Tonight we are going to have kind of a little send-off um, fellowship after church for the Arscots, all right? And, uh, you know, they are just having to travel so far to get here, and uh, they, really, they really didn't want to have to do this, but it's it's just one of those things where, where going to church there is a whole lot more convenient, but, but we're going to remain friends and just continue as everything was. Just We're just not going to see them as much here at the church. But we're going to just have a little something tonight for them just to say thank you for all that they've done. They've done so much for us here and have been such a tremendous blessing. Um, but uh, also, oh boy, I forgot. There's one other thing. Yes. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, she said, do you have the announcements in order? And I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> um, if you have your goal cards tonight, make sure you put them in the offering plate. All right. Remember what I said to come up with three goals for this year. And I would like to be able to put those goals on my prayer board and pray for you so that you'll maintain and keep those goals going. It's always good to keep a goal going. You know, uh, New Year's resolutions are, they're only good if they keep going, you know. Um, and uh, one thing that I have found as far as new goals, new, uh, uh, you know, new plans, new habits is, uh, is the, what do you call them, Marianne? Build on, build, build on, add to? Stack habits. Where you decide you're going to do something before you do something you're already you're already doing a habit like like fixing a cup of coffee in the morning. You decide, okay, I'm going to do this before I fix that coffee. So that would be called a stack habit. That's helped me. Um, uh, one of my goals is to, I mean, look, 
you don't have to be spiritual about everything. I guess it is spiritual. It's helping your body physically uh, for the honor of the Lord, right? But uh, I've chosen to drink water before I have coffee every morning. That's helped. I need to drink more water. So just some ideas. I shared them with you last time. If you'd like a list of that, I can share it with you again. Um, uh, but uh, tonight, please put them in the offering plate, and I, will be, I would like to be able to pray with you about those things, okay? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, let's pray. And um, I am going to sing the uh, chorus song for you again. All right. Just I'm going to sing it myself again. It's a little bit difficult to catch on to. And uh, so I want to sing it once and then we're going to sing it a second time so that all of us can sing it. All right. And uh, we won't do this every Sunday, but I just want to do it one more time so that we can become familiar with it. Okay. So, Lord, we do come to you right now. And we thank you so much for the gift of eternal life that we have in Christ. And we thank you for all that we have in Christ. And uh, Lord, I just pray that you'd help, help me uh, while these people are here to show them just a little bit of what's in the package. And uh, Lord, I just ask that you'd help us all to leave here today uh, just knowing what's available in Jesus. And uh, Lord, I... Uh, can't imagine ever preaching a sermon without using the name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, that this is a church that preaches Jesus. That's the only thing that matters. Now, Lord, we pray that you just bless us as we continue our worship together. Lord, we pray that you just help each person uh, to receive a little of what you have to say. And we thank you for everything in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so I'm going to sing this for you, and then I want you to join me, okay? <clears throat> I will not fail you, you are my precious child, what troubles might abound, what doubts and fears arise, I will not fail you, just trust in all I say, I've won the victory, that you might triumph every day. There is nothing I cannot do. Don't be weary, for I know the plans I have for you. I will not fail you. I'll be right by your side. In me you are complete. Find strength and courage as you abide. I will fail. Do you think you can do it? Okay, let's stand and sing. All right, I will not fail. <laughs> I will not fail you. You are my precious child. What troubles might abound? What doubts and fears arise? I will not fail you. Just trust in all I say. I've won the victory that you might triumph every day. There's nothing I cannot do. Don't be weary, for I know the plans I have for you. I will not fail you. I'll be right by your side. In me you are complete. Find strength and courage as you abide. I will not fail. Amen. All right, you can be seated as we sing our final hymn. And uh, I was encouraged and inspired by uh, what Josh had to say for our Sunday school class. We're getting ready to start a new series, so make sure that you make plans to be a part of Sunday school. You know, I think Sunday school kind of pushes everybody away. I wish there was another name for it, but it's just always going to be Sunday school for me. Um, but uh, it's not really necessarily school. It's just we, we're, we're being schooled in the in the ways of Christ, and we get a chance to involve ourselves and ask questions and share things, testimonies, things that we that that we've experienced during the week. And uh, you know, if you don't if you don't raise your hand, Josh will keep going. But if you raise your hand, he is happy to stop and listen to anything that you have to say or share. 
And, uh, he, you know, there are times where he may ask questions, but um, this is a time for you to get involved. It's, uh, you know, if, you know, there's also other classes available for our young people. I'd like to be able to see classes for every age group uh, at our church. Uh, but uh, but just uh, if you would just be a part of Sunday school, that's so important. Um, uh, Josh is doing a good job in our class. I really have enjoyed it. Harrison's doing a great job with our little ones. Uh, Miss Lisa, of course, she's always been uh, faithful to our, our, our young kids. I'll tell you, they, she's been a blessing. Uh, but uh, I'll tell you, it's just there's a special time before church from 10 to 11. Make sure you're there, okay? That's really a blessing. All right, well, uh, 372 is the song that he had read during Sunday school, moment by moment. And I just want you to think about that. That's how we walk in the Spirit. Every decision we make, we say, Lord, is this what you want or is this what I want? And, uh, you know, there's too many people today living for the now. They don't think about the fact that we're going to live for all eternity. They're living for right now. And, uh, you know, the fact is now isn't going to last very long. Our life is a vapor. We need to be preparing for eternity. So moment by moment, we need to walk in Christ. Pay attention to the words. You might be too familiar with the song that you don't pay attention to the words. But moment by moment, all right, let's pay attention to those words. All right, here we go. <clears throat> 372. Dying with Jesus by death reckon mine. Living with Jesus a new life divine. Looking to Jesus till glory doth shine. Moment by moment, O oh Lord, I am thine. Moment by moment, I'm kept in His love. Moment by moment, listen, I've life from above. I'm looking to Jesus till glory doth shine. Moment by moment, O oh Lord, I am thine. Never a trial that he is not there. Never a burden that he doth not bear. Never a sorrow that he doth not share. Moment by moment I'm under his care. Moment by moment I'm kept in his love. Moment by moment I've life from above. Looking to Jesus till glory doth shine. Moment by moment, O oh Lord, I am thine. Verse 4. Never a weakness that he doth not feel, never a sickness that he cannot heal. Moment by moment in woe or in weal, Jesus my Savior abides with me still. Moment by moment, I'm kept in His love. Moment by moment, I fly from above. Looking to Jesus till glory doth shine. Moment by moment, O oh Lord, I am Thine. Amen. All right, well, we're going to take up our morning tithes and offerings. And you be sure to give with a heart of thanksgiving. And I know that the Lord will bless you for that. I also want to mention, too, that March 17th will be the first, the first day that John Van Gelderen will be with us. And I would like it if we could just think about maybe giving just a little bit more than what we normally give each Sunday. I want you to just pray about it. You don't have to do it this Sunday, but I want you to just think about it for the next times that we take up the offering. I'd like to be able to take up a collection to where we can uh, support our man. 
all right, and give him uh, the money that, that, that he came. And I'll tell you, he gives us riches from heaven, John. He is something. And uh, he's a blessing. He has seen God work in so many places in the world. And uh, I'll tell you, you're looking at a guy right now. I, I don't think I would be here if it wasn't for John Van Gogh. Uh, and uh, so I would encourage you to give. And uh, those of you who've never heard John preach, you'll be glad you gave. So I encourage you to give right now with a heart of thanksgiving and a heart of, uh, of expectancy of what the Lord is going to do March 17th in that week. All right. So, uh, Jonathan, would you pray for us, please? Gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you today thanking you for an opportunity to be in your house. Father, we do pray that as we come to a time to give back to you, that you would help us to be joyful givers. Father, would you burden our heart as to what you would have us to do for the man of God that will be coming in March, Lord, mm -hmm. give us wisdom in that. Provide for us, Father, as you would see fit that we might be able to give abundantly to your land. Mm -hmm. Father, I just pray that you would strengthen us here this morning. Help our pastor give him the words to say. Help us to honor and glorify you in all things that we do. And we ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Let's turn to the book of Matthew, okay? We're going back to the Sermon on the Mount again. After we covered the Christmas story, we backtracked a little bit during the Christmas holidays. And uh, if you remember, I skipped that passage on purpose so that we could do it during Christmas. And so we're back to Matthew chapter 6, all right? So let's turn there. Matthew chapter 6, and we, the last time we were in this section of Matthew, we had looked at uh, doing alms and, uh, you know, just doing it as a, as a vain show. Uh, there's a whole lot that's, that we find in this passage here that will open the doors to our prayer life in ways that uh, you could only dream if it's accessed properly. I want you to understand that when Jesus came down to teach, there's a lot of movies that are made about Jesus. And I would not encourage you to base the way Jesus taught people on the Sermon on the Mount on a movie. Okay, you have to understand that a lot of times the movie makers are not as in touch with God as they ought to be. Uh, you know, I, I, probably one of my favorite um, uh, my, my favorite portrayals of Jesus would have recently been the chosen. But even that, uh, I, don't, I don't sense a connection uh, that, uh, that, that really there ought to be with God. And so we have to really be careful uh, when we do that. Uh, the, the word of God is always the sole authority. And I want you to understand that when Jesus came down to earth, he was excited about what he was getting ready to do. Um, there were, uh, you know, he, he had come into a world of darkness, no hope. Uh, there, was, there, was, uh, there was nothing to look forward to. And when he showed up, you know, you ever, you ever met somebody who when they come in, they think that they're God's gift to the church or, or God's gift to whatever, you know. And uh, they're, like, they're like, let's get this party started. I'm here. All right. Now, look, I'm going to tell you, I'm not saying that Jesus acted like that, but Jesus had every reason to be excited that because he was in the world, 
it was time to get the party started because he was about to unleash the windows of heaven on this world. When the angels said, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. He said, peace, that's what we look for. We often want peace, but also goodwill. Great things are about to happen because our Lord is finally with us. And uh, so while he's teaching, I want you to understand that he's saying a whole bunch of stuff that these people are probably not going to understand. And when I preach this to you today, I want you to know that you may not understand everything that I say. All right. And we're going to actually backtrack a little bit and look at this more extensively. But I'm going to kind of try to do a, a quick overview this morning so that you can uh, gain a feel of what's going on. But Jesus is about to teach them how to pray. And he's excited about it. He's, he, he says, here's how you're going to do it. All right. So let's look at what he says. All right. Uh, verse five. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not. All right. So, you know, whenever you're going to teach somebody how to do something, you always start with showing them what not to do. All right. Right. And so uh, he says, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. Because they need a stage. All right. That's basically what it's saying. Did you know that Hippocrates actually means an actor? Uh, if you if you look at that word, it's actually if, if we were to be speaking in Latin or Greek or I, I, probably Greek and you were talking to Socrates, Socrates would be calling all of his actors on the stage. He'd be calling them all hypocrites. And he actually would. He's a great hypocrite. <laughs> I'm telling you, this guy right here, you need to hire him. He's a good hypocrite. All right. And uh, we would say, that sounds awful strange. You know, he's encouraging you to take him on because he's a good hypocrite. No, what he's saying is, is he's a good actor. I know a lot of good actors in the Baptist church. <laughs> I know Baptists who can push the tears out of their eyes. Oh, it's been so good to me. And they go home and swallow all the candles. What do I mean by that? All right. <laughs> I was at a funeral. I was telling my brother and, and, and his wife the story. But I was at a funeral one time. And, you know, sometimes they call me up and they ask me to do a funeral because they don't have a pastor. Basically, they don't go to church. And so I'm up there preaching. And all of a sudden, I, <coughs> I start getting I get something. I think it was a gnat. And I, <coughs> I'm sorry. I said, boy, talk about swallowing a gnat or, or straining at a gnat to swallow a camel, you know. And they just kind of looked at me like, like a cow looking at a barn door. I'm like, uh, I'm, and, and then I said, oh, yeah, I forgot. Y'all don't go to church. I didn't say that. <laughs> okay. I wanted to, though. Oh, you wouldn't understand that, would you? All right. But uh, what that means is straining at a gnat to swallow a camel, that means that you've got a lot of people who they'll have like, we'll say a, a cup of tea, all right? Brother R's got fixed coffee today. And we'll say that we're Jews. And a, a hypocrite will go, oh, there is a gnat in my drink. Let me get it out with these tweezers, all right? What's going on? Everybody sees him and goes, oh, he really keeps the law. Down to the very gnat. See, the Bible says that a gnat is a six-footed creature, and he's not to be eaten. He's an insect. He's unclean. And so we shouldn't eat gnats. We shouldn't eat anything unclean, including gnats. But while they're not looking, they're swallowing camels, which is another unclean animal based on the book of Leviticus. So he says, don't pray like them. Look what it says, all right? And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. There was an actress that said, an actor is only rehearsing without an audience. That's very true. I've been in the acting business. I like having a crowd. There's nothing like acting in front of a whole bunch of people and getting the loud applause. And these hypocrites here pray loud, oh Lord, be 
because they want everybody to know how well they can pray. All right. Now, there are some people who are very careful not to do that. And you know what? I don't fault them at all. It's best to be quiet and say nothing than it is to say anything at all. Some people prefer not to pray out loud corporately. If whatever the Lord lays on your heart to do, you need to do that. But the Bible does say scripturally that all in Christ, male, female, Jew, Greek, slave, rich man, it doesn't matter who you are. Everyone is one in Christ. And when we have a corporate prayer meeting, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're a slave or whether you're a free man, whether you're rich or whether you're poor, it doesn't matter who you are. You can lift up your voice in the name of Jesus and say, oh, God, we need you. It doesn't matter. Because we're all one in Christ Jesus. Now, there are some who don't feel like to do that. But the Bible says that anyone can. All right. So he says, don't pray for an audience. All right. That's what we're saying here. They're saying you're looking for a stage. Don't do that. So notice what it says, that they may be seen of men. Verily, I say unto you, they have their reward. They have it. Not much of one. Oh, they get the praise of men, but it's not much of a reward. Verse six, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy father, which is in secret. And thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Notice who does the rewarding. Can I tell you there's a difference between an award and a reward? An award is great job that was just amazing and that's all you get a reward keeps on giving that's the kind of reward the lord wants to give all right so uh so he says uh, uh the lord will re reward you openly you know there's a lot of people in the world who are uh you know they're in situations where everyone is against them Seems like the world is turned on them. It seems like there are people who have a voice that speak out louder than they do and just smear their name. Some of you who are not on social media, you're smart. Hey. Now, <laughs> you set it up. <laughs> I only have to deal with you one more time. <laughs> oh, you know I love you. <laughs> uh, I was getting ready to say for the rest of us, <laughs> uh, you know, it is a great, uh, you know, I personally believe that Paul would probably be on Facebook because he has things that he wants to give out, wants people to know, things that edify him, all right? Now, those of us who don't want any dirty laundry aired out, we're going to stay away from it. All right. Now, I, you know, I'm going to say that's pretty smart. All right. Now, uh, so here's here's what I want you to understand. All right. He's saying in secret. Here's here's what happens. I'm naming the worst possible scenario. We'll just say that the world is against you. There are voices crying out against you that are false, but everybody else supports them. And you think that you're sinking low. You go into that closet where nobody else is. Enemies who think negatively of you. How many of you have ever read the story, The Scarlet Letter, or have at least ever heard of it? Okay. This poor woman had to walk around with a big A on her chest everywhere she went. And A was a letter that meant adultery. And do you know who the father of the baby was? It was the preacher. That was the story. That's how it went. She had to bear all of that while he's up here preaching, thus saith the Lord. It was a, an awful story. She had the world against her, but it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're, uh, I, I can't remember her name now, but anyway, but it, do, it does not matter who you are, no matter how what you've done in your past, no matter what your some of you start to tell me your past. And I'm like, stop right there. I said, the Lord's chosen not to think about what your past is. And I don't want to know either. I don't need to know. I'm not a priest. 
There's no screen in front of me where you say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. You know, you call me Father, I'm going to say, don't say that. The Bible told you never to call anybody Father on this earth. No, you, there's only one Father. We're about to see that in just a minute. But, uh, but you know, it doesn't matter who you are. You go into that closet and you come between you and the Lord. I'll give you an illustration of this in the Bible. There was a woman that was taken in, adul in adultery. All right, I'm, I'm just I'm I'm, I'm using I'm, I'm using this as an example. Okay, there's all sorts of different things. We could say there was a woman that was in the midst of getting high. All right, or there's, you know any kind of sin. But in the Bible, it says that there was a woman taken in adultery, and she was brought out in public. Right? I mean, it's, she was caught in the very act. There's no telling what kind of a situation it must have been. But they took her and they threw her in front of Jesus, and they said the law says that we ought to stone this woman, but what do you say? And she's sitting here in shame, probably weeping, probably bruised, probably cut up. And he begins writing on the ground. And I don't know what he was writing. Some people try to discern what it was. All I know it was the finger of God. He can write whatever he wants to. And as he was writing, he stood up and he said, the man that's without sin, let him cast the first stone. And what happened? They put their stones down and they walked away. I don't know exactly what that meant for them, but I can tell you this, it was her and the Lord. And he said to her, woman, where are your accusers? And she said, there are none. And he said, I don't accuse you either. Stop sinning. You know, this is what happens when you go into the closet. The Lord Jesus is with you in the closet. And he says, where are your accusers? I don't see them anywhere. I don't accuse you either. Now, let's get down to business. That's good stuff, isn't it? All right, now, some people think they're finished. No, you're not. Not in the closet. Not in the closet. When God's with you in the closet, you and him make the majority, you can still change the world. Now, let's keep going here. But thou will not, okay, I'm sorry, verse seven. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. Now I know my boys, I'm, my boys, I am not trying to preach to you because you've come to me. You've, you've told me, some, some of you have come to me and you've said, I sure do say Lord a lot, don't I? And I said, yeah, well, well, we need to work. We'll, we'll work on that. You know, hey, you noticed it. Okay, that's good. So I'm not preaching to my boys here. Okay, but I, I'm guilty of it too. A lot of times when we pray, we don't think about what we're saying and we start saying, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would do this, Lord. And Lord, we ask also, Lord, that you would, Lord, do this. You know, it's, it's kind of like me talking to Brother Glenn. Glenn, I need you to go out here, Glenn, and do this, Glenn. And Glenn, make sure that you remember this, Glenn. You know, Glenn's like, I haven't forgotten my name. <laughs> or as Pee Wee Herman would say, that's my name. Don't wear it out. <laughs> All right. Some of you are like, who's Pee Wee Herman? <laughs> All right. <laughs> old guy anyway all right so so he said don't use vain repetitions you know it's not just the name re repetition it's also and i have i am not against prayer lists prayer lists are good if you're going to look through them and seek for what god wants you to pray about at the particular time all right i have a prayer list it's a very disorderly prayer list <laughs> stop laughing it's a very disorderly prayer list, but I have a prayer list, but it's only up there because it helps me to get on track with what the Lord wants me to pray about. It shouldn't be something that you say, Lord, I pray that you'd be with Adam Waltz and uh, Cannon Bloom and uh, Chesley Howell and uh, Tracy Popper. And you just go down the list and you do it every single day the same way all the time. The Lord's like, oh, here we go again. That's the Lord. I'm serious. He's like, look, don't pray vain repetition. Look what it says. All right. He says, uh, uh, um, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. They think God's going to listen to them based on what they say and how well they say it. That's not true. Look. Uh, some of these kids in the sands in Chicago, they asked D.L. Moody, by the way, we, you know, Lionel? Yeah, that's his middle name. He might be related to D.L. Moody. That's pretty awesome. Anyway, <laughs> but D.L. Moody was asked the question, 
by one of these kids in the sand, these, you know, rough kids. They said, hey, Mr. Moody, how do you pray? He's like, I don't know. He just got saved, you know. And he just, he, he listened to these guys in school pray. Somebody asked him to pray in school and he started praying. They started laughing at him. And he said, Lord, help me to pray. And, and uh, he, he, all of a sudden he took out a piece of paper and he wrote something down. And he came to that kid at the sands and he said, there's, he, he, I'm, I'm just going to illustrate for you. You may not even be able to see it, but he, he, he wrote down this. He said, you know, that, that question, that question that you asked me about prayer, this is about the only answer that I can give you, son. Help. Hey, if you know the word help. You're getting somewhere. <laughs> Help! You know, I did that on the mountain over at uh, Tennessee, and they sent out a search party for me. <laughs> there was a gurney. I came down from the mountain. I mean, I had a mountaintop experience until I could hear, where are you? <laughs> I got down, and somebody said, was that you up there crying for help? I was like, no, no. I'm like, sorry, Lord. I lied. <laughs> I was calling out for help, but I was calling out for help spiritually. Why can't I find a private place? But anyway, I cried out for help, but I think the Lord heard me anyway. But <laughs> Chris knows I get myself in trouble all the time. <laughs> But, all right, so, so he says, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do, all right? Now, notice what it says. For your heavenly Father, now this is important, knoweth what things ye have need of, what does it say? Before you ask him. Now, that's interesting. Do you know, that, you know what that means? That means he has everything laid out and knows exactly what's about to happen, even when you don't. You say, Lord, I got a problem. And he says, I already got an answer for you. Well, I knew about this problem a long time before you did. So here's the question. Well, if he already knows the answer, how do we pray? I mean, he knows the answer. He knows what I'm going to ask for. What's the point of even asking? That's where Jesus comes in and he says in verse 9, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. So notice the therefore. If you're in the habit of marking in your Bibles, underline that word therefore. All right? Therefore is a word that's used to allude to something before, something that he said before. So he says, I'm telling you, don't pray with vain repetitions. Don't pray for a show. And so therefore, how do we pray then in this manner? This is how you do it. Our Father. All right. First of all, I want you to notice the hour. When it says hour, this would be a good example, basically he's saying you can go to your closet, you personally, or our Father. That means that we're all corporately praying together. All right, corporate prayer meetings are some of my favorite times, especially when we're all in one accord praying for the same thing, fighting the very same battle, and I'm really close to preaching your message, so you better get something together. <laughs> because it's good. Wilson shared something with me. I'm about to steal his thunder, but I'm not going to do it. But it was powerful. But we, but when we, when it comes to praying for the same thing, boy, I'll tell you, there is nothing like a prayer meeting where we're praying, where, where we get in line and we start praying for one thing. You know, we don't come thinking, well, I'm going to pray for what I want to pray for. No, we come with the attitude of, I want to pray for what everybody else has in their hearts as well, because the Holy Spirit's working in one accord on all of us. Our Father. It's not about me. I'm not a hypocrite. I'm not an actor. I'm, I don't need a stage. Our Father. We're lifting you up. All right. Our Father. Dad. What does that mean? It means we've been born again. Father. If you've been born into the family of God, you've got a new dad. That's good stuff, isn't it? You know, I'm adopted. And, the, and the, the fact that I'm adopted, that means that, I, you know, uh, from what I understand, it's easier for a, a real father to disown their kids than it is for an adopted son to be disowned. 
That's pretty, pretty neat. Now, we see an example of that, by the way. Jesus, God pretty much disowned him, didn't he? In order to adopt us. Of course, he took him back. I realize that. I understand. He bore the sins of the world, and then he went back to be with him. I understand that. But there was a breach that will be there for all eternity. All for us. That's amazing. All right, now, so he says, Our Father, which art in heaven. All right, now that's important, all right? We're going to look back at that in just a minute, okay? It means he's, he's a, a long distance away, which art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. You know what you're saying there? A lot, there, a lot of people try to discern it and explain what that means. And yes, God's name is holy. I realize that. You know, we can think of a, a 365 names, more than that. My wife, my wife did a search and found over 900 names in the Bible that signified the Lord. We can learn all about his name. But in this particular case, he's saying, we're not here to make a name for ourselves. We're here to call on the one solitary name of God. We're here to talk to you, Lord. We're not here so that everybody else will hear me or hear us. We're here so that you hear us. We're talking to you and only you. Did you know that you're also hallowed? The Bible says that he prays. He says, sanctify them. That's the very same word. Sanctify them through thy truth. Are you sanctified? Are you set apart for his use? Then you're hallowed too. You know what that means? That means God has you specifically in mind. And when we get on our knees and we pray, we say, okay, God, I'm putting out all of my enemies, all of my friends, everything that even matters to me. And I'm thinking only on the name of God. Hallowed be thy name. Not my name, not anybody else here, but thy name. Hallowed be thy name. All right, now, then he says another interesting thing. All right. Um, thy kingdom. Thy kingdom. And I got 10 minutes here. I'm going to try to try to get through this. All right. Turn to Isaiah, if you would. Um, get to the right. Yeah. Isaiah 5. Okay. What is this kingdom? All right. Thy kingdom come. Is it come? Well, we're going to find out. Why pray thy kingdom come? All right, what does that have to mean? What, what does that mean? So now when he says, by the way, when he says after this manner, he doesn't, it would be against what he just said if you have to quote this verse. How many of you could quote the Lord's Prayer, by the way? You probably learned that from a school or from a church. And a lot of times it's the Methodists or uh, the Presbyterians a lot of times. They say, let us now recite the Lord's Prayer. Now, I love the Methodists. Uh, they, they have some good people, and God uses the Methodists, to, does to this day. The Asbury Revival, good night. I mean, they put us to shame. But I don't think that it's necessary to say every Sunday, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, or our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's almost like a commercial that you can't skip. <laughs> I'm not trying to diss on God's word, but that's not what Jesus meant. All right? So he's saying, thy kingdom come. What does that mean? All right, look what it says in... Um, in, in uh, Isaiah 5. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. Now that's interesting. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. Do you know what he's talking about? He's talking about Israel. He's actually talking about the kingdom of Israel. All right, now Verse two, and he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes. All right, now I want to help you understand something. What he wants you to see right here is 
He wants you to see, this is my garden. This is my vineyard. There are things, all right, would you agree with me that, that God is the, the, the husbandman, the gardener? Would you agree with me? Okay. I think that as a gardener, Judson, when you plant something, you expect that to come up, right? Because you're the gardener. He has a plan. He made a tower, fenced it in, made sure everything was right because he had a plan and he wanted something to be done. And he wanted it to grow grapes, but something happened and it brought forth wild grapes. What in the world? Wild grapes would be poison grapes. The birds can eat it, but humans can't. They'll get sick. All right. Verse three. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore then, wherefore when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down, and I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. Now notice verse 7, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Now, what does that have to do with the kingdom? Okay, well, we're going to look at another passage here really quick. All right, look at Luke. Now, hold your place in Matthew, okay? But I want you to look at Luke chapter 20, okay? Luke chapter 20, and I want to look at verse 9. Then, or is everybody there? Okay. Then began he to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and led it forth to husbandmen and went into a far country for a long time. And at the season he sent a and at the season he sent a servant to the husbandman. Now notice, by the way, that he the husbandman went to a far country. Our Father, which art in heaven. All right. Verse 10, and at the, at the season, he sent the servant to the husbandman and they, that, that they should give him of the fruit of the vineyard. But the husbandman beat him and sent him away empty. And again, he sent another servant. All right, these would be the prophets, okay? And they beat him also and entreated him shamefully and sent him away empty. And again, he sent a third and they wounded him also and cast him out. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It, it may be that they will reverence him when they see him. But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? All right, and then he says, uh, uh, he, he answers, he gives the answer. He shall come and destroy these husbandmen and shall give the vineyard to others. Now notice what they say. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. Why is that? Because they know that in Isaiah chapter 5, he's talking about the kingdom of Israel. And what happened? When he came riding into, into the city on a donkey, you remember that? They were crying out, Hosanna. They were ready to make him a king. But he went up onto the mount, and what did he do? He wept over Israel, and he said, the kingdom is left to you desolate because they rejected him. So what did he do? He took the kingdom and he gave it to the church. So now he's saying, thy kingdom come. Is it here? Yes. We're just waiting for the king to show up. And he's coming. One day they're gonna, there's going to be, you know, you, you know, we, we actually celebrate Christmas partially. You know, I kind of like a full Christmas. <laughs> Even though we celebrate July Christmas. Christmas in July. <laughs> Even though you might play Christmas music all year round, we still don't celebrate a full Christmas. We won't celebrate full Christmas Day until the second time it comes back. The return of the king. Not the return of the baby. All right? Or the coming of the baby. All right, the second, when the, sh the second shoe drops, that's when we're going to celebrate a full Christmas. And that's when he's going to come and take his kingdom. But right now, the kingdom is in this world. And guess who the subjects are? And so he says, thy kingdom come. He's saying, I want you to pray this because you're his royal subject. All right, now look, let's go back to Matthew, okay? 
Thy kingdom come. Oh boy, where was I? <laughs> Matthew, Matthew 6? Okay, Matthew 6. Yeah, I got that. <laughs> 10. Thank you. Okay. Thy kingdom come. Now notice this. This is what the problem is. All right. So he says, when we ask for something, does he not already know? Yes, he already knows what we're going to ask for, doesn't he? So what's going on? Look what it says. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Okay. I think I'm getting it. What's going on? The Father has a plan. And it's in heaven. And the only way we're going to see that plan fulfilled in heaven, he's got a blueprint. It's all laid out. They're all, the, the angels in him, they're all standing around. I don't know. I don't know what it looks like. But anyway, he's got a plan. It's all laid out. I want this to happen at New Grace Baptist Church. I want this to happen in Savannah, Georgia. I want this to happen in Alpharetta. I want this to happen to Kennedy Carpet Care. I want this to happen in Williamston. I want this to happen in Tarboro. I've got a plan for the world. But it's not going to happen until my subjects unlock the door and start asking for it. So thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it already is done in heaven. Now I can show you some other passages that support what I'm saying. Okay, but basically what that's saying is, is that we have access. Do you realize that as human beings, we were created. We are the only creatures uh, from the smallest insect to the largest star. We are the only creatures that have a link between the physical world and the spiritual world. Not even angels are linked to the physical world. They're celestial beings. We are human beings beings we have a link to physical and spiritual that's why jesus constantly says do do on earth as it is in heaven on earth as it is in heaven if two of you shall agree on earth touching anything that they shall ask it shall be done for them of my father which is in heaven so there's a link heaven god created the heaven and the earth there's a link and when he said let us make man in our image he created a being now, through Jesus Christ, God is linked to earth now. But not before that. God was a spirit. Not even God would, had that special link that he created us to be. All right? And I, 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 I realize he, he is all powerful and can do whatever he wants. I understand that. What I'm saying is, is he made us very, very special. And he gave us a will. He gave us the choice to do right or wrong. Okay? I got to wrap this up. All right, but he says, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what about the kingdom? What does this have to do with the kingdom? Notice, all right, really quick here, because I'm going to wrap it up. All right. Notice that he says in verse 10, thy kingdom come. And in the very same verse, it says, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. What's going on here? All right. Now, turn with me and you can just turn there. You don't, we don't have to go back to Matthew. Turn to John. Okay. We don't have to go back to Matthew because I'm finishing up. All right. I'll never forget when I said I'm finishing up. I can't remember when it happened, but I heard a kid in the back go, finally. <laughs> <laughs> Might have been mom. I can't remember. But <laughs> oh. All right. So look what it says. All right. I am the true vine and my father is the what? The husbandman. Well, what? wait a minute. I thought I read about this somewhere. Isaiah chapter 5. If you're in the habit of marking in your Bibles, you should write down next to husbandman, Isaiah chapter 5. Okay? Yes. <laughs> I was just looking at the... I was like, I was like boy, they're going to write, write the wrong verse in there. Yeah, Isaiah 5. All right, so I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch, that's you and me, every branch that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Now notice this, 
abide in me and I in you. Notice the order. You have to abide in him before he can abide in you. Uh, when, if, you're, if, you're, if you do any kind of exercise, you know that eating is 50% of exercise. If you eat garbage, it's not going to help. You're like, I'm going to eat uh, Krispy Kreme donuts and then go work out. That's not going to help me. <laughs> you know? But I'm thankful for the Krispy Kreme. It was really good. You know, they say that manna was as the taste of fresh oil and it was also sweet, which means it was a Krispy Kreme donut. <laughs> I, mean, I really think it was, no, I'm just joking. But, but anyway, so, so notice, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except to abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. Now notice, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that, what? Abideth in me and... I and him, there's that same order again. When you eat something, it abides in you. It begins to do a work in you. You know, when I eat a piece of chicken, I don't have to tell the chicken, all right, now I want you to go and fill my biceps, all right? No, the chicken does what it's supposed to do once it goes inside. So if I abide in Christ, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, then Christ begins to do the work in me. But you have to sit at the table. You know, you can say, well, I go to church all the time. But how much do you pay attention? How much do you take in God's word? How much when you sit down at the table, you know, we, we can make our kids, you know, eat their vegetables and all this stuff, but they can eat it like this. Can I throw it away now? I had like three peas. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You know. Just because the peas were on their plate doesn't mean it's not it's going to do any good unless they eat it, right? That's abiding in the peas, right? You're abiding in the food, you're abiding, and then it's going to abide in you. It's the same thing with God. So he says, uh, if, uh, I'm sorry, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do what? Nothing, all right? Uh, Boy, I'll, I could tell the story of Steve Pettit that Chris just shared with me. Boy, that man abides in Christ. And God used him tremendously at the Citadel one year. You have to ask Chris about that. That was amazing. Um, but it says, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. I'd love to steal Brother R. Scott's thunder, but I'm going to let him preach that. These guys keep showing me these amazing illustrations and I'm having to ponder it in my heart but anyway oh no i'm not gonna do it all right if ye abide in me besides we gotta go <laughs> anyway <laughs> if ye abide in me and my words abide in you look what it says what does it say ye shall what ask you shall ask what you will and it shall be done so what he's saying is is when you recognize that the kingdom belongs to dad and you seek his will and you abide in the bread, the Holy Spirit will abide in you and he'll show you things to pray for. And if everybody at New Grace Baptist Church abides in the very same bread, the very same bread is gonna show us the will of God together. And we're all gonna say, God, I think I know what you want us to do. Somebody's gonna pray. You know that verse that says, if two of you shall agree on earth is touching anything that they shall ask. Do you know how we know we're in agreement? It's when suddenly we'll say, Sister Alicia says something, Lord, we need God to come down now. And all of a sudden you hear everybody go, yes, God, yes. That means the Holy Spirit is in our midst working. Doesn't mean we got to start speaking in tongues and all this other stuff. Brother R. Scott thinks I have the gift of tongues. <laughs> if you call my cell phone, you'll get it. But anyway. <laughs> but... But, but look, what I'm saying is this. Recognize who the kingdom belongs to. Don't go up again. Don't stop seeking a platform when it's not yours to take. Recognize who the king is. Recognize that he's coming. Recognize you're a subject and say, Father, we're coming to you because it's an emergency. We're in a mess. We need help. Hallowed be thy name. We're talking to you alone. Lord, I, I don't know what everybody else thinks, but I think that I speak for everybody. We need you to come down and do something here. We need you to show us what your will is on earth as you've already planned it in heaven. We know you got a plan. Lord, there's a lot of stuff we want to do, but we're throwing all that out the window. We want to know what you want to do. 
hey, guess what? God will meet with us. Lord, I thank you for this time we can be together. Lord, I thank you for the, for the answers to prayer that we've seen in this church in the past. I thank you for the answers to prayer that we'll see in the future. If we call on you the way that you would have for us to. Lord, help us to stop being so religious. And I'm talking about myself. Lord, help me to stop doing things like, like they're supposed to, like, like it's going to matter. Lord, I pray that you'd give us a hunger and thirst for Jesus alone. And Lord, I pray that you just help us to cast out all, and I'm not, I'm not trying to say that we release inhibitions or anything like that. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying, Lord, help us to cast out all of those crazy man-made habits out the window and to seek you earnestly because we recognize how much we need you to work. Now, Lord, there's a world that's out there that's lost and you still want us to reach it. Show us how to do that. Show us how to reach those people that have never heard. Lord, use Judson. Lord, I thank you for his heart for missions. Lord, use, use Josh. Lord, Josh, Josh was express, expressing how God's moving in his heart. Lord, just use all of our young people. Lord, show us what you'd have us to do. Call Brielle into the ministry. Lord, we're asking you to do mighty things in the name of Jesus. Lord, we ask for you to help us. We recognize that you're the vine dresser. Lord, you're the one who's in charge of the vineyard. This is your kingdom. Lord, we want your will to be done. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm going to have my wife play. I just want you to just decide. Just, just talk to the Lord. Just say, Lord, I recognize this is your kingdom. And I think I understand a few things. You might not have understood everything, but think about something you did understand about this message. You might even say, I understand everything he said, but I couldn't really put it in words. And that's okay. As long as you learned, look up here, guys, everybody. As long as you learned where this goes, you learned something today. So just take some time with God. And if all you can say is help, say it. I'm going to just say this really quick and we'll go home, okay? Some of you have it in your head right now. Pastor, we need to go. We need to start having corporate prayer meetings and stuff. You're going too fast. What is it that Josh said? You're putting the cart before the horse, all right? Enter your closet first. Go to that place where neither friend nor foe, that's your right or your left hand, okay? Friend, foe, go to that place where it's just you and Jesus and say, okay, God. I don't know what everybody else thinks, but I want to get to business in your kingdom. And can I tell you something? That's where it all starts. So before you start on a crusade of, we got to get new grace. No, get in your closet, start talking with God. Any of those ideas are going to burn out. Okay. Let's just seek him individually and come together when God has us to come. Okay. Lord, I thank you again for this time we can be together. Lord, I pray that you just be with